destroyed by 2018's Camp Wildfire. Grammer's first work there, a, part, a painting of a woman, quickly went viral. Grammer was so moved by the outpouring of praise that he returned to spend a full week painting on charred chimneys, cars, and other remains. He wanted to do what he could to inspire those who are starting over. He says it's kind of a stamp that life was here and life can return. Oh, is that beautiful? Yeah, it's just spectacular. And, and, and powerful messages. Good for him. And what a gift. Folks slowly returning to normal back in California. That's our time for now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow. News 3 at 5 starts right now. Right now at 5, a jury has found the man accused of killing 21-year-old Jesse Faber guilty. We'll have reaction from Faber's family. We'll tell you what we know about the suspect who is accused of killing an 80-year-old man in Sauk County. And leaders across all of Walworth County are coming together in hopes of an expanded or highway. This is News 3 at 5. And thanks for staying with News 3. One year ago today, a Sun Prairie man was shot to death. Today, a jury came back with a verdict for the man accused in that shooting. Our Charlotte Deleste is here now with the details. Charlotte. Well, Susan and Eric, that jury found Daniel Lisky guilty of first-degree intentional homicide in the death of 21-year-old Jesse Faber. The 60-year-old shot Faber five times. Lisky and his fiancée, Michelle Goss, hid his body in a storage unit in Rio. Both Lisky and Goss pleaded guilty to that. Faber's parents were there when the verdict was read. They say it was, quote, sweet justice on this one-year anniversary. Happy and relieved that he's going down. He ain't going to get out. Like April says, nobody should have to go through this. Nobody should have to bury their child, ever. April Faber's mom says, quote, going through the trial opened up all the wounds, but in the end, it's worth it because the truth came out, end quote. Lisky faces life in prison for the homicide conviction, plus 12 years for hiding Faber's body. The court has not yet set a sentencing date for Lisky. Emotional day in the Very courtroom. Emotional. Charlotte, thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Authorities still on the hunt for a murder suspect. They believe Robert Pulvermacher is responsible for a man's death in the town of Delton. Our Keely Arthur joins us with the very latest. Keely? That's right. It's day two of the search for Robert Pulvermacher. Authorities responded to reports of sightings of him yesterday in Madison, but he has yet to be apprehended. Robert Pulvermacher is believed to be responsible for killing an 80-year-old man in the parking lot of the Ho-Chunk Casino in the town of Delton Monday. He's been on the run since then. The Sauk County Sheriff's Office and a number of other agencies, including Madison PD, are looking for the 68-year-old with an extensive criminal past. Paul Vermacher was found guilty in Dane County of burglary in 1997 and 1998. Guilty again in Adams County in 98 for recklessly endangering safety, felony possession of a firearm, false imprisonment, and intentionally pointing a firearm at a person in Adams County. That same year, he escaped from federal prison in Duluth. He was back in custody a week later. Paul Vermacher was once connected to the high-profile Dane County murder of Father Alfred Coons. Sheriff Dane Mahoney tells us Paul Vermacher was questioned about the 1998 homicide because of his past burglary convictions, but was cleared because of a solid alibi. Flash forward more than 20 years later and Paul Vermacher is considered the sole suspect in the Ho-Chunk homicide. A warrant is out for his arrest. And of course, if you see this man, please call authorities and maintain a visual until they arrive. Kelly Arthur, thank you for the update. Police are releasing surveillance footage of a man they believe was involved in a stabbing Tuesday night in Platteville. Platteville police responded around 1110 to a stabbing on North 2nd Street near Furnace Street. Officers found the victim with stab wounds to his head and stomach. The stabbing reportedly took place in the parking lot near 2nd Street. Witnesses say the stabbing possibly stemmed from an altercation that happened in a bar. Anyone with information is asked to call the Platteville Police Department. The Madison Police Department asking for help locating a missing 11-year-old boy. Officials say Dominique Hale needs to be on his medication or he could become very ill. He was reported missing around 8.20 this morning. Hale lives in the 1600 block of Wright Street in Madison. Police said there's no evidence that Hale is a victim of any sort of foul play, but there is some concern for his welfare because of his medical situation. Anyone who sees Dominique or knows his whereabouts is asked to call 911. Let's get a look at your first alert weather now. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti joining us.
us on the weather patio. Gary? Things are pretty quiet out here right now. We've got partly cloudy skies. They'll cloud up later on tonight and actually cause our temperatures to warm up a little bit. But let's start out by taking a look at the alert days that we have in the forecast for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We could be looking at some snow developing late Friday into Friday night into Saturday morning. It could bring several inches of accumulation, followed by colder weather later Saturday with high temperatures only around 20 and falling afternoon temperatures. And on Sunday, low temperatures will be near zero with wind chills from 10 to 20 degrees below zero. On Doppler track, you can see things pretty quiet across Wisconsin. There is a little bit of light snow out to the west of Minnesota. That'll reach us by tomorrow morning with some flurries or some freezing drizzle, but nothing imminent right now. As we look at current temperatures, uh, they're in the lower 20s here in southern Wisconsin. Wind chills are generally in the uh, middle to upper teens, so not terribly cold. And our forecast first calls for those temperatures to gradually uh, drop off into the uh, around 20 degrees by late evening, and then those temperatures will start rising later on tonight. That's a look at your first alert forecast. All right, Gary, thank you. Attorneys for a man accused of kidnapping a Wisconsin teenager and killing her parents acknowledge his confession could present a problem in his defense. According to a criminal complaint, Jake Thomas Patterson told investigators he broke into 13-year-old Jamie Kloss's parents' home near Barron back in October, gunned down her parents, and abducted her. He said he took her to a remote cabin, sometimes keeping her under his bed for hours on end until she escaped last week. Patterson's public defender, Richard Jones, says investigators have compiled 30 banker's boxes full of evidence for the defense team to review and that he's not sure Patterson will get a fair trial in Wisconsin. Patterson's attorneys also say his motivations will become more clear as the case progresses. They do not know how Patterson will plead. A Madison West High School teacher is off the job after using a racial slur at school. West Principal Karen Boren said in a letter to parents yesterday that a substitute teacher is banned from teaching in the Madison Metropolitan School District after using a slur around a student this week. Two other teachers, one at Madison East and one at Madison West, were removed from Madison classrooms in November after they reportedly used racial slurs. Also in November, a teacher at Hamilton Middle School resigned from the district after she was accused of yelling the N-word at a 12-year-old student. A McFarland man is arrested for his fifth OWI after eluding deputies. The Dane County Sheriff's Office says it happened just after 2 this morning when they attempted to stop a car that had no taillights on. This was Commercial Avenue in Madison. The vehicle driven by 42-year-old Troy Hall failed to stop and sped off. Deputies say about a mile later, Hall drove onto the railroad tracks on Milwaukee Street and became stuck. Four people ran from the vehicle. Hall, along with his three passengers, were all taken into custody. He was booked into the Dane County Jail on multiple charges, including fifth offense OWI. Four people that ran from the vehicle, Hall included, were again booked in on a fifth offense OWI. City leadership in Whitewater is hopeful a new state administration could bring them a highway they've been wanting since the 1960s. They say it could revolutionize the city and also make things safer. News 3's Adam Duxter joins us now with how they're making progress after all this time. Adam? Well, Eric and Susan, leaders across all of Walworth County are coming together in hopes of an expanded or new highway connecting Whitewater and Alcorn, something they say is long overdue. Now, currently, the stretch of Highway 12 connecting the two cities is just two lanes, and people in charge of this say that it not only makes it hard to get from place to place, but that it's flat-out dangerous. Whitewater City Manager Cameron Clapper says in order to make the changes happen, they're relying on state leaders to complete an environmental impact study regarding the project. Getting us on the schedule and getting us in the minds and in the, in the sight of legislators and Department of Transportation um, leadership in order to make that happen, we really need to have this environmental impact study done. Uh, without that, we're, we're just, we, we can't even get started. It's the first step. Per says getting the environmental impact study completed essentially gets them in line to get the project done. And he and other leaders across the city of Whitewater say they're confident this could be the time to move on with this project and say they could have an impact study done as soon as next summer. They say that new highway could really be a chance for them to grow that area. We'll continue to follow it. Adam, thank you. Congressional leaders say they will cancel their upcoming Martin Luther King Jr. holiday recess and instead they'll stay in session unless a deal on border security is reached. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi sent President Trump a letter asking him to postpone the State of the Union address until the government is reopened. Citing a strain on security, Speaker Pelosi said both the U.S. Secret Service and the Department of Homeland Security have not been funded for 26 days now, with critical departments hamstrung by furlough. A new analysis from the Council of Economic Advisors shows the standoff over the border wall is impacting the economy at twice the rate the Trump administration expected.
This is in, requires hundreds of people working on the logistics and the security of it. Most of those people are either furloughed or, or victims of the shutdown. There has been some impact, but at the same time, uh, again, we're focused on the long-term economic principles that the president's laid out. The Trump administration recalling some 50,000 federal workers now to work without pay, and that includes food inspectors and staff for the Internal Revenue Service. Meanwhile, Madison Mayor Paul Soglin is weighing in on the partial government shutdown. Mayor Soglin says most of the problems will not happen until March, but he says he's worried about the city government as well as services to the people of Madison and Dane County, which will be impacted. Those programs include the WIC and SNAP programs, which are food programs that help feed children and low-income families. We've been through some of these shutdowns before. I have never seen one where a president has held the whole nation hostage and jeopardized the lives of so many people over a temper tantrum on, on a specific project. Mayor Soglin says he also may lose a city employee because work visas are not being processed and documented workers across the state may not receive their work visas due to the partial government shutdown. Governor Tony Evers says he will likely include a first step toward legalizing medical marijuana in his first state budget proposal. WIS Politics reporting today the governor was asked about his views on marijuana and said he favors legalization but doesn't want to rush things here. The governor says his budget proposal will likely start the process of legalizing medical marijuana and other steps for full legalization, including possibly calling for a statewide referendum. Governor Evers says he would sign that bill, but adds, quote, I just want to make sure we do it correctly. Republican Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald has said he does not support legalizing medical marijuana, while Republican Assembly Speaker Robin Voss has said he is open to it. Now might be a good time to fill up your vehicle with fuel because experts say they're expecting gas prices to rise. AAA says gas prices will likely rise for the first time in three months. Madison residents are enjoying gas prices lower than the national average at about $2 a gallon. The national average is up a penny this week to $2.25. It increased for the first time since October. AAA expects current prices to be the bottom for 2019. The price of of crude oil has been slowly but steadily increasing since January 1st, and that is starting to push up prices at the pump. And some sports news today. The Packers continue to add coaches to their staff this offseason, announcing the formal hiring today of former Jacksonville assistant Nathaniel Hackett as new offensive coordinator. He spent most of the last four years with the Jaguars as quarterbacks coach and then offensive coordinator before being fired in November after Jacksonville lost its seventh consecutive game. More to come on News 3 at 5. Up next, a deadly attack in Syria kills two U.S. service members. What it could mean for the president's plan to withdraw troops from the country. And the death toll continues to climb after a terror attack at a luxury hotel in Kenya. And on Wall Street, the Dow Jones average with a 142-point climb Today, the Nasdaq picks up 11. The S&P adds a half dozen. We'll be right back.
The Pentagon has confirmed two U.S. troops are among those killed in an ISIS attack in northern Syria. ISIS says one of its fighters launched the assault outside of a restaurant, detonating a vest filled with explosives. The attack came less than a month after President Trump declared victory against ISIS in Syria and said 2,000 U.S. forces stationed there were coming home. The White House released a statement extending sympathies to the families of the victims. Some lawmakers on both sides of the aisle are again criticizing the president's decision to withdraw from Syria. The danger to our troops will only increase because of the haphazard and lack of strategy that we have in Syria. We're never going to be safe here unless we're willing to help people over there who will stand up against this radical ideology. The president of Turkey says the explosion may have been an act aimed to deter the United States from withdrawing troops. An American businessman among those killed in yesterday's terror attack at a luxury hotel in Kenya. Officials say Jason Spindler was one of the victims in the attack. He ran a development agency in Kenya. According to social media, he was a 9-11 survivor and graduated from the University of Texas. Authorities say the death toll has climbed to 21, plus the five militants killed. 28 people were wounded. The Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab group has claimed responsibility for that attack. Wisconsin-based Shopco announced today it is filing for bankruptcy. According to a press release, the company has filed voluntary petitions for a court-supervised financial restructuring under Chapter 11. In December, uh, Shopco announced that it was closing 39 stores in 19 states. Last week, six more stores were added to the list. Starting today, YouTube is banning videos that encourage risky activities that could result in physical harm. The policy change comes the same month a teenager in Utah crashed her car while driving blindfolded, a stunt inspired by the Netflix film Bird Box. YouTube is also banning videos containing containing pranks that make victims believe they're in serious physical danger or cause children to experience emotional stress. Chief Meteorologist Gary Kinalti joining us now with a look at your first alert forecast. And Gary, it, it felt good to see the sun out there today. Yeah, anytime you have the sun where it's been cloudy for a few days, it always feels better. Temperatures are just slightly above normal, but that will change. We'll get some snow on the ground here by the end of the weekend or by uh, end of the weekend. And by the end of the weekend, temperatures will be probably the coldest values we've seen so far this year. Year. Now, we have alert days in the forecast for Friday night into Saturday and Sunday. Light snow developing late Friday afternoon or Friday evening will continue Friday night. Could see several inches of accumulation, and then that will gradually wind down on Saturday. Some minor accumulation still a possibility in the morning. It'll turn colder Saturday afternoon. By Sunday morning, temperatures will be down to around zero with wind chills from minus 10 to minus 20, and highs on Sunday will only reach the lower teens. Doppler track right now, pretty quiet here. Some flurries showing up in Minnesota and western Iowa. Those could reach us tomorrow morning with some flurries or a little patchy freezing drizzle. But there's that hole in the snow across southern Wisconsin. That will fill in. Areas to the south will be hit hardest again, uh, just like the last storm. In fact, the uh, computer models, the European computer model, this is through Sunday, uh, about noon Sunday showing about an inch or two here in the Madison area, uh, several inches down toward the Illinois state line, the heaviest amounts farther to the south. The GFS computer model showing heaviest amounts out to the west in um, southern Minnesota and northern Iowa, uh, about four inches in Madison, almost five inches in Milwaukee. The uh, local uh, RPM computer model showing about two inches in Madison, but maybe as much as eight inches in the far southern portions of Grant County. So you can see all the computer models in very good agreement. Heaviest amounts of snow will be to the north, lesser amounts to the or, uh, to the heavier amounts to the south of Madison in northern Illinois and eastern Iowa, lighter amounts to the north of Madison, and the GFS uh, future track sh computer model shows the snow overspreading southern Wisconsin. This is midnight, uh, late Friday night, early Saturday morning. The heaviest snow continuing into early Friday morning. Then it winds down. That's noontime, and by about 6 p.m., it's pretty much gone. But the northerly winds in the wake of the storm, and with skies clearing out, allow some of the coldest air of the season to arrive by Sunday into Sunday afternoon. Now, as we take a look at the live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison, a little lighter now at 5 o'clock, uh, still showing generally cloudy skies here. High today, 33, low temperature, 22. Right now, we're sitting at 23 degrees with partly cloudy skies. Winds out of the northeast at 7 give us a wind chill of 15 degrees. Temperatures range from the single digits in northern Minnesota to around 30 just south of Chicago. Upper level winds right now from west to east, but the big storm starting to develop from California into the Rockies. That will be the big weather maker, but it'll pass mainly to the south, at least the worst of the part of the storm.
Low pressure is already forming in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles, and it will ride right along that stationary front, dividing milder conditions to the south to the colder air to the north. Temperatures right now below zero up near the U.S.-Canadian border, but still in the mid-40s, close to 50 down toward the Ohio River. And as we look at future track, you can see those clouds coming back tonight, few flurries. Then you can see the main part of the storm developing to our south and west as we head into uh, Friday morning, and then by uh, Friday afternoon, the snow starts to arrive, and again, the heaviest snow will be just to our south as the main area of low pressure tracks through southern Missouri and up the Ohio River. So our forecast uh, for tonight calls for skies to be uh, mostly or partly cloudy this evening, then it'll turn mostly cloudy overnight. Low 20 this evening, then rising temperatures overnight. Tomorrow's high at 32 with perhaps a few flurries or a little freezing drizzle in the morning. Future track shows that pretty well. Temperatures rising a little bit overnight. We'll see that flurry freezing drizzle chance tomorrow morning. Temperatures up around 32 in the afternoon. Tomorrow night skies clear out for a little bit. That allows temperatures to drop into the upper teens. The clouds come back on Friday. The snow develops late in the afternoon. High temperatures will be in the middle 20s. The snowfall amounts about two to four inches from Madison southward. Lighter amounts to the north and west. Heaviest amounts down toward the Illinois state line. Seven to ten day forecast calls for colder weather in the wake of the snow. Look for high temperatures only in the teens for Sunday and Monday. Some light snow chances could bring additional accumulations Tuesday through Thursday of next week, followed by another shot of cold air for the following weekend. As we take a look at first alert traffic, things aren't too bad out there right now. The live view from the DOT camera at uh, John Nolan Drive and the Beltline, a little bit of a, a slower travel commute in the eastbound direction. Some delays there between uh, Monona Drive and Park Street. Westbound, some delays between Fish Hatchery Road and Park Street. But right now, about an 18-minute commute eastbound on the Beltline from University Avenue to the interstate. 17 minutes going back in the westbound direction. Heading out of Madison, it's 26 minutes down to Janesville on I-3990. 15 minutes to Sauk City on US-12. And 16 minutes to Sun Prairie on East Washington Avenue and US-151 at your first alert traffic. All right, Gary, thank you. Ahead at 5, Sears is saved. Details on the latest effort to keep the doors open at the iconic department store.
Welcome back. Sears lives to fight another day. The company's chairman worked out a deal to keep hundreds of stores open. Hillary Lane spoke with relieved shoppers. Michael Shrilecki has been shopping at Sears for 50 years and just heard about the company's last minute reprieve. I think that's fantastic. That's what it's all about, keeping people working. That's what I love to see. Sears billionaire chairman Eddie Lampert has thrown the struggling retailer a lifeline. Lampert won a bankruptcy auction with a bid of more than $5 billion. The hedge fund manager was the only buyer with plans to keep the company alive rather than liquidate the chain altogether. If the bankruptcy judge approves the plan, more than 400 Sears stores would remain open, saving tens of thousands of jobs. But analysts say the company is still facing an uphill battle. I think the story is sort of a sad story. Investors have been keeping a worried eye on brick and mortar stores since the rise of e-commerce. That whole sector is obviously got coming up against a lot of problems, right? Amazon is, is in, at a level that it's wiping out so much of that. Founded more than 130 years ago, Sears was once the nation's largest retailer with 4,000 stores and devoted shoppers across the country. That includes a relieved Wilma Bryant, who shops for her extended family. I feel good about it. My kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, I have a lot of those. After more than a decade of declining sales, Sears may now have one last chance to turn the tide. Hillary Lane, CBS News, Yonkers, New York. A federal bankruptcy judge will rule on Lampert's bid at a hearing later this month. And stay with us. We'll have one more check of your forecast in just a moment.
Here's a look at some of the stories we are working on tonight. Four Americans killed in Syria in the deadliest attack since U.S. forces have been involved. David Martin will explain what happened. Will the State of the Union speech be moved or even take place this year? And one of the last great mysteries of World War II has been solved. Tonight on the CBS Evening News. And Gary's here now with a final check of the weather. Yeah, we've got alert days in the forecast for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for snow from Friday night into Saturday, and then very cold temperatures on Sunday. Snow totals right now, are, this is a kind of a first guess. We're thinking about two to four inches from Madison southward, maybe four inches or a little bit more toward the Illinois state line, an inch or two north and west of Dane County. That could shift north or south, depending on the exact track of the storm. Temperatures right now in the 20s, they actually may rise overnight, but after the snow, notice those temperatures really nosedive for the weekend. There's more snow chance is next week followed by another shot of cold air. And we're back in 30 minutes for News 3 at 6. The CBS Evening News is next.